Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. So, Adam, it is a pleasure to, to see you today. Um, how have you been? Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Uh, just finishing up the edit for a, a couple of new episodes for next week. Awesome. All right, so um, if we go back to the beginning, was there a defining moment for you to get into the film industry? From the film industry? Oh, that's a great question. Um, no, what, 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 it's hard, isn't it? No, um, I, I went to uni and studied film and knew I loved movies from as a kid. So, no, I think it's more of a gradual, um, slippery slope, I suppose. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose, you know, if I was being flowery about it, um, my parents bought me a making of book for The Lost World Jurassic Park, which was oh, this right, yeah. that came out, and I, I read that book so many times the pages fell out. So, uh, I, maybe that. Maybe that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, Steven Spielberg is 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 an idol to so many of us. <laughs> um, all right. So I just streamed the first seven episodes of Containment. What was the impetus of starting the series, and how many episodes will there be in the okay, series? Um, in terms of episodes, we're going for eighteen. I think eighteen or twenty. Um, okay. We haven't quite decided because we're still lining things up on timelines. You don't. You know. It's a push and pull. Um, but to, just in terms of the series, uh, Anna Oliver gave me a call. Probably, I think they locked everyone down to on a Monday. And I think we, we had the conversation the week before that because we kind of knew it was coming. We were like, this could go on. Shall we do something together? We were, we were looking at doing a physical project together anyway. Um, and she said, well, look, let's take it online. Let's get some actors. Then it was a short film, a few actors. And then it kind of grew and grew as we realized we knew more and more actors who kind of said oh i'll do something cool for that or i'll do something cool for that and um yeah it just kind of spiraled into this monster thing that's now awesome. much bigger than all of us i think which is cool yeah yeah awesome um it, it is that why what you just said about it being a short film first and then uh, then the series afterwards um is that why there's a there's a slight difference between how episode one is and then how episode two is because um, I, when I was watching it, I noticed that there isn't a title card uh, for the first episode uh, to say, like, um, in the in the early 20th century uh, yeah. and, like, to set the, set the groundwork. Um, not, not strictly, because we, once, we, once we had people shooting, I think we, we, we knew what we were going for, but we didn't know. And we were still finding our feet in terms of how, uh, how we wanted to tell the story. But we knew we wanted to get something out there. Um, so we released episode one and then have been just very gently, if you have a, we've been amending things a little bit, like some of the feedback towards episode four was can the title card stay on screen longer? So that's actually got very gradually longer. Um, we, we didn't just do it so it's super long, but it's now 10 seconds, no, nearly 10 seconds longer uh, than, it, than it started life. So it's just been a gradual amendment, listening to what people are saying, uh, adjusting it so people get the best experience out of the story. Uh, and what we're finding now is that people are coming to the show and they're actually finding it now. And then we're starting to get more and more people starting on episode one now, um, as opposed to when it came out. And so it's starting to get a life um, outside of us tweeting about it, as it were. Awesome. All right. So um, um, do you have any preferred genres and any favorite films? Uh, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Uh, not so much the deep space kind of sci-fi, more like the grounded. I'm a big monster movie fan. Um, you know, I like ordinary people in extraordinary situations kind of stuff. Um, so that, I suppose, uh, in terms of sort of favorite films, um, depends what day it is. It sounds terrible to say that, but I, like last night we watched Parasite, uh, uh, the Oscar winner from this year, and I thought it was terrific. Um, mm. I've been building up to watching it for a while. I've been thinking about watching it for a while, but I wanted to be in the, really in the mood to give it the attention it deserves. Because there are sometimes, you know, you switch on and you think, oh, I just need a, a pop conflict today. Like, I, it's, you know, you might have had a rough day. I think I just want to switch my brain off at the door and be entertained. And then there's the kind of films you want to think about. So I don't have favourite films based on anything other than my mood, I suppose. Okay, well... Why not? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. at the moment, I think um, a lot of us are watching comedies because of what, what's going on outside. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to think about it too much and just like uh, kind of switch off and just have some fun. A uh, bit of escapism. It, like That's essentially what films are, are all about anyway, um, is escapism. Well, that's kind of what we wanted to do with this show. You know, it was like, first of all, we need to, we need to stay creative in, in lockdown. How are we going to do that? It's very easy to sit here and just watch the news and freak out. 
Uh, and we kind of wanted to go, well, actually, it's something for us to do creatively, but also we were shocked at how many, not shocked, I suppose is the wrong word, but like surprised uh, how many people wanted to, said, oh, I, I really want to do something. And, and then the goal of the series has been to, if we can entertain 10, 15 people for 10 minutes a day, um, that's, that's, that's done. That, that was our goal. So we never thought it would be anything other than a few people would watch it. So we've had 2,000 people nearly watch episode one now. Um, that's really cool. Uh, and those are starting to drip through the show. And we're hoping everybody sticks around for the, uh, for the, for the end, as it were. Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to see. It, it, it's quite, a, quite an interesting concept being that um, it's, they're just, they're, there's no crew. They're just using what's around them to, yeah. to create it. So you've got what, one of your actors that is using his dog. Uh, you've got another one that is um, uh, that I found quite quite funny with different wigs that you can make. Oh, yeah. uh, so, um, and there's that's another one that the, that's the uh, most the, obscure story in the whole thing, kind of where that goes. Uh, you will not see it coming. Uh, okay, you've already met where it goes, but yeah, you won't have noticed. So if you go back and watch episodes one to seven, there are clues, um, but they're quite subtle. Um, okay, you will not have spotted it. Um, but it's 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 out there, yeah. Okay. All the best well, I'll, I'll have to go and watch it again. Um, <laughs> right. So, um, uh, where was I? Um, uh, uh, as a writer and a producer and a director, are there any other aspects of the film industry that you want to want to pursue? Um, I love editing. So, um, I, and I do a lot of editing now. I've, I've kind of in lockdown. I've actually managed to bring in a few projects you know kind of cutting for friends and stuff so i guess i found my mojo with editing i really like editing and i've been lucky enough to work in the locations department on a few things here and there on the bigger stuff um which has been really insightful like a huge learning experience um so that so that's always good fun absolutely um so uh, what are you using as an ed for editing at the moment uh, I'm using Premiere Pro. I'm a big Premiere fan. Uh, I do really like DaVinci Resolve, actually, but we use that mostly for color grading now. Um, so, yeah, Premiere and then any sound work we're doing in Adobe Audition and then switching over to DaVinci for color grading. Okay. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, I, well, when I, when, I, when I first started with video editing, I started out on Premiere. Um, mm. I'm now using Final Cut Pro uh, okay. religiously yeah. because it... Cause it, it has a feature that I've not found in any others, and that's a sync feature where, yeah. um, where I could because I record the audio separately to the video, yeah. um, and it used to take me hours on the timeline working out how to, where where to go uh, with the uh, with, sometimes it's better than others, but now yeah. with with Final Cut, it's like you just it, you just wait a few seconds. We, we found that we cut a whole feature on Final Cut X uh, back in the day, and we found it was great to edit on, um, but when you're trying to get your sound out to the people like, in the right format that you need it to be designed and, and to, to kind of export from, not that user friendly. It's from on that kind of project. It's great for any web based stuff that's going straight out of it, straight onto the net. But if you've got any mastering in the middle of that, uh, that's why we switched to Prem. Because uh, okay. uh, it's just a bit friendlier that way. I find I can get the soundies almost anything they need out of Premiere and the same with DaVinci. DaVinci uh, is quite similar to Final Cut X in some ways. Uh, I, I think the user interface is quite similar. Okay. Well, great. And also with with the, with Adobe, you have the uh, have the um, the beauty of these of the suite. So you can it plugs straight into Photoshop and plugs into uh, uh, After Effects or what, um, whatever else. After you Effects uh, eludes me still. I still can't make After Effects do what I want, but um yeah i love the the cross usability like you can take one thing from somewhere and put yeah. it somewhere else and, and that is only something i'm just getting to grips with how powerful that that tool is um uh, but we're all learning all the time aren't we mm, absolutely you're always learning in this industry never sitting still well exactly. kind of are but you're always learning yeah. um so you have a great range of credits um are there any genres that you haven't done yet that you'd like to that's a great question um, I never know what's going to come next. Uh, if I'm right, I'm working on a short film at the moment that I'm super excited about. I can't really say anything about. Um, not until we start announcing stuff. But um, I never know what's going to... I, I don't try and pick 
a genre. Like I've never sat there and gone, I really want to do a war film or I really want, I just kind of get a story for some reason. I like, I'll, I'll go through a year where I'm developing like five or six different things. And then one of them, usually out of nowhere that I didn't think was very good, um, suddenly just takes off. And that's the one I end up, but something tells me I'm making that now. Uh, and then we make that one happen. So I've, I suppose I've tended more into the sci-fi elements um, but I tend to try and mix genres quite a lot because I don't like to be uh, penned in. I think it's great to have rules, but I always think it's great to try try new things. So uh, the next thing is a sci-fi, um, but after that, I don't know. If it's the feature film we're developing, that's a horror, kind of a psychological thriller horror with a twist. Um, but I, I don't know. It's hard to know, really. I, I, I don't think I would go and make a period drama. Okay. I can tell you with that well, relative, something a bit more. relative certainty, I don't think I would go and... I mean, the exception maybe being, you know, to work on something like The Crown. Uh, but I, I don't think I would write one. It's not my cup of tea. I've never sought them out. Uh, mm. There's a lot of people for that. I, I, I like watching them sometimes, but I'm not... I don't like writing them. I find that there's also a lot of that, isn't there, in Britain. Uh, I feel like in Britain, the British film industry gets a little bit preoccupied with making period dramas and uh, films set on council estates featuring pregnant teenagers. And I just think, actually, we make great genre movies. If we decide to make one, we're really good at it. Um, and I'd like to see more UK genre filmmakers pushing things out there and getting more UK genre features made. Because it tends to be a little bit of a of uh, science not really happening too much. Yeah, I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, so you've worked with a great crop of talent. I mean, there are, um, so with containment, there's a lot of familiar faces in there. Um, do you have a wish list of who you'd like to work with next? Um, it changes all the time. Uh, I guess you just want to work with, regardless of who they are, you want to work with people that, that inspire you. Um, and, you know, with containment, we gave a brief out and the actors have really been in charge of their own stories they've taken it on the, on the initiative and stuff so what's been really awesome is to see these 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 takes on our stories come in piece by piece and then we'll do notes and the next piece comes in and, and we'll try and stay ahead of the story it's just to see how it's to sort of let actors run free in a way and, and create this at times bonkers material um that is sort of like nothing i've ever done before uh, and uh, I, I love that. So I think it's just about what you've got to work, rather than having a wish list, I suppose, that's the wrong wrong word. It's whoever's right for each project at the time. Uh, there's actors I admire. I think Olivia Coleman's unbelievable. Um, but again, there's going to be thousands of actors who are not as famous as Olivia Coleman that should be. So it's about trying to find those actors and, and kind of working with those actors and raising everyone's profile together. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one, one of the familiar faces of obviously Mel Crossy, um, yeah. and she's just great in there, uh, like changing her voice as, the way that she has uh, for uh, Ashley, isn't it? Um, Ashley, Ashley, Watts, yeah. Ashley. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, one of my favourites. And that, that one, um, I'm seeing, I'm a little bit further ahead than you all are with Ashley Watts. Um, and yeah. things get um, a little crazy in my mind. Um, she features heavily in 9, 10, and 11. So. Um, you could, you've got that to look forward to. Absolutely, that's great. It's always a always a pleasure to see her on screen. Um, so, um, uh, um, so, yeah, I'll combine those. Um, so, like other other than people like Olivia Coleman um, and like Mel, um, who inspires you within the, within the industry? <sighs> oh, that's such a tough question. Anyone that's getting their films made. Anyone that's out there getting their films made and putting them in front of audiences. Like, that's so hard. Uh, it's so hard. There's no, you know, in terms of if you can jump over the funding barrier, that's amazing. If you can, uh, you know, if you can make a film for £100, get it out in front of audiences, then you are, you are doing it the right way. I think there's so many people out there who have never had the courage to make their film uh, or have gotten lost along the way with fundraising and are still working on that film they started shooting 10 years ago um you can very easy to get lost in that i think very easy to get addicted to the struggle 
to some extent and actually people that are powering themselves to make a film, put it out, learn from it instead of over tinkering and then make another one. It's about consistency. And so anyone that's consistently creating stuff that's funny or, or, or just out, out there at all is, is inspiring. Awesome. Um, so uh, um, obviously you've mentioned that you're a big sci-fi fan. Um, are the, uh, fandoms are a big part of the industry. Um, are, um, who else are you, who, what else are you a fan of? Um, in terms of films or in general? In, yeah, films in general. Um, I, I'm a big Jurassic Park, Jurassic World fan. Uh, always have been. Uh, kind of follow the whole um, staff. I've got quite a lot of posters and collectibles and things like that. But I try and keep the collection classy. You know? Like, I, I, <laughs> like I'm, not, I'm not one of these people that's got all the toys in boxes. Uh, that's not me. Um, but you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of, of that franchise and what they do. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of. Um, of, of, of what Marvel are doing. Um, I think regardless of how you think they act creatively, uh, which I know they struggle with filmmakers and, and, and voices and things like that, actually what they've achieved is nothing short of incredible. Um, and, you know, a lot of people criticize them for kind of not being real movies. The reason why they're making a lot of money is because they're telling great stories in packages people want to see them in. Um, and so I, I, I understand why people maybe don't like them, uh, but I also understand, I don't think that's any reason to flag them off, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like um, Endgame, uh, Avengers good. Endgame, is, it, it, ha it had the unenviable task of not only being a sequel to Infinity War, but being a sequel to 22 other films that came yeah, before and, it. And they balanced it beautifully. They actually stuck the landing. And yeah, you know, you compare that to something like Rise of Skywalker, which on the whole was actually really entertaining, good fun, didn't stick the landing for me at the end. So, um, and it had so much to pay off. So, it's a credit to the writers and to the creative people behind that film that that succeeded at all. Um, but then, ever since they started making Avengers films, they should have probably collapsed under the weight of their own cast, and they don't. Um, and I think you can't. Um, you can't underestimate how much talent there is in Marvel. Um, I certainly Absolutely. would love to work with Marvel Studios on something, eventually, yeah. later in years from now. I think they're brilliant. Um, they are. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like, they're... they're I, hes I, ha I hesitate to say rival because they're not really, because, like, uh, like, a rising tile... Uh, uh, what's the... A rising tide rises all ships, I think that's the saying. Um, so, I mean, like DC, what they're unable to do with their films is what Marvel have been doing for over a decade. Exactly. Uh, and I think that um, the way DC approached things, which was to let the filmmaker have the voice, is great. You have to stick to that. Uh, and they didn't. They panicked. Uh, what happened with Justice League was, I mean, ugh. Um, you know, however, yeah. however, however <laughs> messy that got behind the scenes. Um, I think we can all agree that, that so, so Justice League was not the film it should have been. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the same can probably be said for Suicide Squad. Um, you've got to, if you're going to hire filmmakers, you've got to let them have voices. Um, and I think the guys at Marvel are very open about, we, we want you, but we want, but you have to do, there's a plan here. And you, mm -hmm. you can get creative, but there are parameters. And I think that there are some filmmakers that survive really well in that situation. And there are others that just rail against the creative um, process there. Um, I don't think either studio is right or wrong. Uh, I think they're very different ways of working, but I think where, where DC have come up against it is they bailed on their, their vision. Um, and then what happens, it just gets a bit, if you bail, uh, you know, especially when they bailed uh, in the middle of production on the most, one of the most expensive films ever made, um, and it now is the most expensive film I think ever made, and, and certainly I can't see how. That's the issue. If it's going to be the most expensive film ever made, you better knock my block off. And, and it just didn't. Uh, it was fine. There were some good ideas in it. Uh, I love Henry Cavill in it uh, and in anything, apart from his weird dodgy face. Um, that's just yeah. so unreachable. I liked Ben Affleck as Batman. I thought he was yeah. great. I preferred him as Bruce Wayne, but he was great as Batman too. So it's um, let's see let's see what the Snyder Cut brings next year and see see whether it. It was the studio's fault or not? Mm. Yeah, time will tell. Uh, <laughs> time will tell. 
uh, yeah. But that, that's why we have movements like the Snyder Cut and they're talking about the AO Cut for, for Suicide Squad now. But yeah. you don't see that on the other side with Marvel because what? Because it's, for all intents and purposes, it is the vision that comes out. I d well, yeah, and, but I think it's uh, it also sets a dangerous precedent, though, which is um, we should be fighting for filmmakers to have their voices. But we also should understand that when a film is done, it's done. So as, as filmmakers, we need to make sure that our voices are being heard because you hire the filmmaker with a voice, right, in theory. Um, mm. But I think it's important to remember that once the film is finished, you know, otherwise you could do this, for, oh, well, let's release the George Lucas re-edits of, you know, let's re it, it creates a culture of if we don't like a film, we can just make them redo it. Uh, mm. And that's not, and I'm not sure that's the most healthy footing for the industry to be on. Uh, I think really what needs to come down to is producers of the material that they're working with need to understand what it is to be a fan of that material and and then to hire people that share that same ethos. It doesn't always work. It won't always work. But you will at least get a film that feels honest, comes from a place of caring about the uh, legacy, especially um, moving forward in new franchises. Um, yeah. I didn't love Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom very much, but I also could see that the people who made it loved Jurassic World and Jurassic Park. So I was like, I don't agree with the creative choices here, but I can also see this was made with tons of love for the uh, originals. Um, and so I get, I get where it's come from. I don't agree, but I get where it came from. Absolutely. Um, so on, on the flip side of that, um, is there a book um, that you're a fan of that, you, that hasn't been adapted to film or TV or Netflix yet that you'd love to be a part of? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's such a, um, any Peter James novel. Uh, so Peter James with the Roy Grace stuff. I know there is a TV um, adaptation of one of his coming, uh, but his books are so inherently cinematic anyway that I think that I would love to get my hands. There's one in particular called Dead Man's Footsteps, um, which is about a man who faked his death during 9-11 and disappeared. And then the story cuts forward in time into Brighton and you realize the two things are connected and you don't know why. Um, I think it's really cool, and uh, I always thought the story was fab. Um, so if I get my hands on that, that'd be terrific. But uh, I believe the rights have now been sold. <laughs> That's what usually happens. Sometimes even before a book is even is yeah. even out there, the rights yeah, have been sold. All the time. Uh, yeah. Um, so with the popularity of streaming services like Netflix and Disney Plus, what do you think the future of cinema is? Cinema's got a place, I think, as long as theatres continue to exist. You cannot beat the theatrical experience. Um, any big movie, I will go and watch it in a cinema. Uh, but, you know, there also needs to be an understanding moving forward that the way we watch things has changed. Um, I think the Oscars... Uh, my position on this has slightly softened. The Oscars, I know, is very much a fan of not crediting streaming services. Uh, as in that, but now we're seeing you know, that Netflix are starting to put the films in theatres. I'd like to see a little bit of ground given both ways. Uh, just because something's released onto, onto something like Netflix or Amazon Prime or HBO Max should not rule it out of, con of being a contender just because it didn't play a massive loss in cinemas. But I do think that where possible, these kind of streaming services, when they bring out things like The Irishman and they get to work with tentpole filmmakers, they should be looking to have those films displayed in the biggest format possible, at least for the people who want to go and see them uh, as an option. And I think if we can meet in the middle so that everyone's happy, I know people that just prefer to watch things on the laptop. I'm not that kind of person. I like the sound system to be nice and big uh, because I like to get as recreate as much of the experience as possible. So I, I think this, um, I don't think, I don't think movie theaters will ever die. Uh, I think the more pressing concern is whether or not budgets will continue to inflate um, and then attendance starts to drop because actually what you're finding is that we're getting to the point where we're no longer impressing anybody. I, I just fear that we've, forgot, we've, lot, we've not in all films, but we're, we're missing the point of filmmaking a little bit at the moment. It's becoming all about how big things are. And actually it's about stories well told, isn't it? And yes. uh, Hollywood's done this before, you know, in the 50s, because it inflated massively up and up and up and up, and then the bottom fell out of the industry, and a lot of films started to lose money. And we're seeing a similar trend now, 
So I'm hoping what then followed that in the in the in the 60s was the um, was the new Hollywood, you know, and the the, the kind of rise of the you know the uh, the Lucases, and also lots of lower budget films, lots of people making interesting stories that then were making money on a much lower budget turnaround. So I feel like we're we're heading for an event a bit like that, and I think okay. that's that's what I'm uh, that's where I'm at anyway. Okay. Um, and ju just finally, going back to containment, um, in your recent appearance on the Delete Scene podcast, mm -hmm. um, you talked about the future of containment. What what can you tell us about that and where can people find it? Uh, so containment's available on YouTube. It's going to run for about another three weeks and then it will always be there. It's just going to be there. Uh, we believe that we're then going to be available on Amazon Prime also. Uh, but it will always be this one set of episodes. There's no sequel. Uh, it's done. Okay. It's going to be done once it's done. I think we all have created something like three hours worth of, of, of content to binge through. Um, we see it as a snapshot of this moment in time. Um, the only way we might revisit an idea similar is say we were to get locked down again. Um, but the relevance of containment is, is, is fast passing. Uh, you know, I think the, the memory of a society is short. Um, and I think once things open back up again, there's going to be a rush to get back to the way things were. Um, so we we feel that it needs to stay as that kind of, it's a snapshot. When people watch it in a year's time, they'll go, oh, that was a snapshot. And we've tried to, whilst it's based on fiction, we've tried to sort of laugh at the things we find funny about isolation behavior. Um, you know, the sort of panic buying blue roll was, I think, hilarious to all considered. Um, and we've tried to poke fun at the things that that uh, that are appropriate to poke fun about, whilst also raising awareness of some maybe some some other issues. And people might have spotted a thread moving through it about climate change. There's absolutely um, that's something we should consider if we continue to wreck the planet. Um, I'm not sure whether or not we should be most concerned about a pandemic or not. And I think I, I wrote, um, you know. I, I wrote a, a pitch for a film recently that did not get through to the, the finals, but it was, I feel really strongly that um, a lot of young people keep hearing politicians saying about the new normal. You know, we keep hearing it online, but that, that is definitely something that they want, but there seems to be a big kind of disconnect between this, this kind of new normal the politicians are talking about, which is, you know, the social distancing, everybody queues up outside shops, and the new normal that young people are looking for, which is very much an opportunity to recalibrate our relationship with the planet. And I think if we miss this opportunity and don't take it, it's a big, big opportunity to hit reset for all of us. You know, we get to reopen society bit by bit. And if we do it right, we can recalibrate a lot of the way we behave on our planet and to our planet. We're, instead of behaving like conquerors, you know, perhaps we should be behaving more like um, a part of the ecosystem as opposed to the person who suppresses it. So there's definitely lots within containment that we want people to think about, take away. Um, and I hope very much that politically we use this opportunity to, um, to, to at least try to recalibrate. Great. Um, and just before I let you go, um, where can people find you and all your work and all your exciting stuff that you've done and continue to do? So I've got a website, it's uh, ajspinksfilmmaker.com. Um, I've got some short films up there. I've got announcements of what we're doing next, um, as well as I'm working on a course to help people make their first short film, like an online learning course, because there's so much that I've picked up over the years, they just don't teach you in film school. So I've tried mm -hmm. been spending a few months now putting it all together, and I'm hoping I'm going to launch that towards the end of the summer, so that uh, a really reasonable price point. Like, I remember, what, and I, I still know what it's like to try and make films with no money. I get it. Um, so we're going to make sure that it's, it's really accessible to everyone, and it's, it's kind of going to demystify things a bit. So hopefully that's helpful to some people as well. Great. I have to sign up to that one uh, when it's available because we're embarking on our first short film. Nice. I was hoping to film it um, early this year, but that didn't happen. Then lockdown happened, and then... Uh, yeah, it's just raising the finances for that. And that's going to be a short film. Yeah, is a the short other thing is, is whenever you think the script is done, it's definitely not done. That's the the because writing's free, and to some extent, I have always found that when we made our first feature, Survivors, back in the day, and we 
we put it, we, we edited it all together and our script was great, right? It was good, like, we were happy with it. Um, but then we watched the film and realized that we'd, we'd forgotten the audience. And because we knew what was happening in our heads, we realized there was a big hole in the middle in the, uh, the beginning where we didn't know what that journalist was doing. So the, the film just kind of started because we wanted to just run off, but we were like, who is this person? What does she want? Um, and who does she care about? And we realized the film didn't really answer those questions. So we, um, we did some additional photography and I couldn't believe. And so that was when I stopped writing screenplays from books and started writing movies I want to watch. Uh, and, okay, well, what information do I need? What does the audience need? We must never forget. Oh, that's, that's the only thing that I think uh, no one teaches anybody. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing what, what you come up with next and the, la and the last few episodes of Containment. I look forward to no, those. I'll yeah. go back and rewatch them again because I, I didn't know it didn't. There's, you mentioned there's a thread with one of the yeah, characters. I'll give, you, um, I'll give you a clue. It's in episode one, but you have to, okay. uh, you have to and then you sort of jump ahead into episode four. And, and, and perhaps if you watched one and four back to back, um, All right. no, one spotted. no one spotted it so far, which is hilarious because it's really obvious. Okay. Uh, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Adam, it's been a been a pleasure. So um, you enjoy the rest of your day, and um, yeah, I look forward to the rest of it. Take care. Have a good one. Bye bye. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more content next time. on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you around Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.